At the end of the previous video I made on chemometrics, we left off with this problem, and now we're going to address it. And I call this a chemometrics fairy tale for reasons that will become obvious in a little while. We saw that in order to do an inverse model where you can predict the concentration of one chemical, such as glucose, from a spectrum without having to know the, anything about the other chemicals that are present in the tissue specimen, it requires this quantity S transpose S to have an inverse. And S is the spectral matrix of all the training samples. If we remember what that would typically look like, we named this spectral matrix. It has a whole bunch of columns, and that's a dimension lambda, the spectral measurements, and the rows are J, the number of training samples. So typically lambda is a very large number. It could be you know, lambda, you might have 100 to 1,000 spectral measurements. So 100 to 1,000 numbers. And if we want S transpose times S to exist, if S is a long matrix wide like this, then S transpose is going to be tall, with dimension J here and lambda there. And that's not typically going to work. This is no good. I'll put a big X across it. We need a situation where J is greater than the number of elements in what we would call the spectrum. And I'm going to put that in quotes here because we don't require that this spectrum be a spectrum of wavelength measurements. We just require that the number of pieces of information that we submit as what we'd call our spectrum S has fewer entries along this horizontal dimension than we have samples that we've measured in this dimension. So there are three approaches to this, which is why I'm referring to the fairy tale, at least in Europe and the United States, of Goldilocks and the three bears, where one thing was too big, one thing was too small, and one was just right. So we've got three options here. And what are they? Our options for how to make the number of samples that you have be greater than the number of elements in the spectrum. Um, option number one would be, obviously, to measure more samples. If you measure enough samples, you can always, in principle, get to the point where the number that you've measured is greater than the number of wavelengths. And that would constitute taking this spectral matrix that you see here that's wide and not very tall, and just continuing to add more and more rows to it so that it gets to be very deep down. It's like this tall without changing its width. You could do that. The downside, um, I'm gonna put a little frowny face there. That's not such a great thing to do. You've got to, you have to do a lot of work. You have to measure a whole lot more samples. You have to make sure that the samples are distinct enough from each other. If you measure two samples that are essentially the same chemical concentrations, the same composition, you're not really making new measurements. You're not really helping yourself. But you could, in principle, do that. And that's what I would call the Papa Bear solution. That's when the bowl of porridge or the chair or the bed was just too big or too much. You can do a lot of extra work and succeed using method one. But we're often in a situation where we've measured a certain number of samples and we want to do our training on less than, say, a thousand samples, but we've got a thousand wavelengths. So we move on to plan two. The second way to have J be larger than the number of elements in the spectrum is to throw out data, throw out spectral data. The problem with that is that you have to figure out, well, which of the wavelengths do I want to throw out? So you're stuck with a situation where you've got some sort of spectrum, a spectral matrix like this. I'm just copying over what I've sort of drawn over here. And now you have to decide, okay, maybe I'll take this region of the wavelength regime and I'll just kill all of that. Maybe there's some region, a little slice over here that I'm going to get rid of. I'm going to get rid of this stuff up on the end and so on. And you keep slicing and slicing away. Sometimes the, the regions can be very narrow. And eventually, the white regions that you've got left over are small enough that J is greater than the number of wavelength elements that are left. So instead of increasing the number J, you decrease the number lambda. 
And that's why I would call this the mama bear approach because the mama bear approach throws out information. So that makes us sad again. Goldilocks doesn't like that because first of all, how did I decide which wavelengths to throw out? And secondly, if those wavelengths have some information, I've lost some information and I don't really want to do that. You could have variations on this theme. I could say there's a 2A where maybe you you bin the data and that would give you, you know, reduced spectral resolution. But that doesn't really solve your problem that you've taken a large number of measurements and just thrown them out or chunked them together in a way that doesn't have any particular algorithm helping you to save the right parts of the information in the spectrum most maximally in order to be able to do your job, which is to predict the, the concentration of glucose. Okay, luckily, there's, as you knew, a third path. And in this path, we make a sort of analogy. We say, what's the true situation here, and how can we approximate that mathematically? And as you saw in the previous video, that real spectral matrix of training data is a weighted sum of the pure spectra, the pure components of the tissue that you're studying, or the specimen that you're studying. That's what we call matrix P. And they're weighted by the true concentrations of how much of each pure chemical there is. So let's remember that the, these, these pure spectra, I can write them like this. This is for each of the I pure chemicals. There's a spectral intensity for each chemical. I can suggest that there's maybe one spectrum that looks like this. That would be spectrum chemical one. Here's pure component number two. It's got peaks in a different place. And here's chemical number three. Now, all of these are real spectra, which means that zero is a baseline below which they cannot go. You can't have a negative going peak. Importantly, the concentrations here, those are the pure concentrations of the actual chemicals. And what are they? They are a few numbers per sample. And I want to emphasize that that set of numbers, it contains all of the chemical information in a very compressed form. When I emphasize compressed, what I mean is that the spectrum of the sample, of each sample, contains all the information about the chemicals that are in it, if you know the code, if you know what the spectra of the pure components were, measuring the spectrum of one sample, as you saw in the previous video, can give you the concentration of every chemical in that sample. The spectrum for each sample is a long string of numbers. The concentration info is just a few numbers. Maybe there's only five or 10 pure components that are actually varying in the tissue. So that's why I say that C is a compressed bit of information about what concentrations of chemicals are in the tissue. But that's obvious. That's the definition of what the concentration vector is. It's the list of the chemicals in the sample. So this is what I would say obviously true. I'm going to make a parallel now, so this is why we're doing this as an analogy. We can also think about a mathematical approach. We start out with the same spectra of the training set, matrix S. And now suppose by looking at all of those spectra, we can develop some sort of basis set, some sort of decomposition. Fourier transforms are one way of taking a vector of numbers and reporting certain sine wave amplitudes that you can build the spectra out of. This is the same sort of idea here. We could have some sort of spectra. I'm going to put zero now, not at the bottom of all of the spectra, but we could imagine having a set of spectra, again, versus an index lambda, where this might be spectrum number one, and then the red might be spectrum number two. You'll notice there's some negative going peaks there, and maybe this third one, the green one, is over here. I'm not trying to draw any direct comparison between these two sets of spectra. Now, we're not going to talk in this tutorial about how you might generate these things other than to make the analogy that Fourier analysis is one way you could de develop a set of basis uh, functions. These are different basis functions, of course. They don't look like sine waves. But let's give that 
ensemble of things a name instead of the pure true spectra if you actually knew what they were we're going to say that these are given the matrix letter v and they're just Analogous, they're mathematical spectra that you can build any actual spectral measurement of a sample out of. And then instead of concentrations, the actual concentrations with physical meaning, we now just have coefficients for how much of each one of these spectra do I need to build each one of my spectral measurements. And I'm going to give a name to that matrix as well. I'm going to call this a score matrix. So this is a set of scores. It's how much of each one of these basis functions you need to model a true spectral measurement. And it's a few numbers per sample. However I developed this set of fitting spectra, I shouldn't need that many more of them, or in principle any more of them, than I actually needed were I to know what the pure components were. If there are only four chemicals actually varying in my tissue, I should be able to come up with four mathematical functions that describe my measurement measured data to within my measurement noise. And just as these scores, these weighting coefficients, these concentrations contained all the chemical information necessary to predict your glucose or whatever it is you want to predict, these scores also should contain all of the chemical info. Again, in a compressed form. And I would say that that's not obvious. So the mystery that hasn't been explained here is how you develop this basis set. But once you've got it, you've got a bunch of scores. Let's take a look at the way these spectra matrix, spectral matrices look. If the pure component matrix looks something like this, it's very long because there's lots of wavelength measurements and there aren't that many pure components. So it looks something like this. That would be P, pure components I, and this would be P I lambda. And the chemical concentration matrix that you're multiplying it by to get the spectra, well, you've got J training spectra. So that's gonna be some amount there, usually larger than I. And the width of that concentration matrix is going to be I to match this dimension here. So C, the concentration matrix is J I in its indices. The spectral matrix here being decomposed this way has a similar vibe. The number of pure components that you need to do the modeling here. You might choose to mathematically compute a few more here than you actually have here. They're just mathematical and we'll talk about methods to develop them. But you're gonna end up with a V matrix that's still got a thousand wavelengths, let's say, as a rule of thumb. You might have up to a thousand wavelengths and you might have a few more than I elements in this, but it's gonna be on the order of I. And so this is going to be your V matrix. And I'll label this dimension I prime because it's sort of analogous to how many pure components you have. It's how many of these spectra you have instead of these spectra. And now that I've got the V matrix, the analogy to the concentration matrix is this T score matrix. And it's going to look Say I have the same height J, it's, I still have, I haven't changed the number of training samples that I have. And it will look something like this. And its dimensions will be J I prime, and there's that dimension J there. And I'll just remind that now I prime is an index over the number of scores, whereas in the previous video, it was an index over the number of pure components. So I pure components, I prime, number of scores, each score corresponds to one of these vectors that are being added together. Here's the key insight about all of this. This T matrix here, the insight is use this as a surrogate 
for the spectra. Look at this. Our job here was that we wanted to get J to be bigger than the number of elements in the spectrum. S had this problem that the number of training samples we measured was much less than the number of wavelengths that our spectrometer records. Now I have a little matrix here which still has dimension J. It has, still has all J samples, but it has a much smaller number of elements in it. So we're going to use T J I prime as a smart compression of the original spectral matrix we started with, S J of lambda. So instead of lambda as its dimension, it's I prime as its dimension. Because this is a smart thing that's just the right size, of course, this is why I would call this the baby bear approach. It's just the right size. In this case, we, we came up with a mathematical way to model the spectra using some black magic I haven't told you about to de deduce these spectra. I'll throw the phrase eigenvectors at you if you want a, a preview. And then once you've got those, those basis spectra, you now have a matrix which only has mathematical meaning. It's a code for how to build uh, the, the spectra out of these V spectra. But this block here is a spectrum per sample. Every one of these rows of the matrix here those numbers moving horizontally, that's a series of numbers, a small vector, just like this spectrum is a large vector. And so that is a small spectrum per sample, and it meets the rule that we started out with here, that we needed the spectrum to not have too many entries in it. We've compressed all the information that we need in order to predict the chemical into a small set of numbers that allows us to then build an inverse model.